one of the, the things that you'll hear over and over if you're newer to our church is you say, what is our mission as a local church in both of our locations? Our mission is simple. We're reaching imperfect people to follow a perfect Jesus. And how many of you have done something this week to prove you're an imperfect person? Raise your hands in the air. Let me see your hands. Yep, I have as well. My wife let me know about it yesterday. Amen? If you are a first-time guest, let me just say uh, one more time, the red Connect card that is in front of you, if you could just fill that out for us. We're so glad to have you here. If you could either fill it out uh, there, you can do it through the QR code if you know how to do that uh, type of thing. You can do it online. Or if you'll drop it off at our big tent outside, the one that you can't miss uh, as you leave, if you could drop it off right there at our welcome center, somebody will greet you. We've got a gift for you that we want to give you, and it'll help us begin to pull you in to become a part of the family and to connect. We are in the last week of our series that we have entitled Money Matters. Those of you uh, that are like, when are we going to be out of this money uh, series? This is it, okay? Uh, next week, we are starting a brand new series that uh, where we are studying the life of David, uh, where we are doing a character study on the life of David. We've entitled it David, uh, uh, King, Poet, and shepherd and or something like that and so uh come back next week and you'll hear more uh about david super excited about that series that we start that we're starting on the person of david and everything that he means uh to our faith he said why are we why are we talking about money for four weeks at saints community well uh really quickly first of all how many know that money matters to us right uh how many of you have had some thoughts about money recently okay how many of you think about money on a pretty regular basis? Raise your hands. Uh, my hand is raised. Okay. How many of you, if you're married, this is one of the subjects that you talk about with your spouse? Raise your hands. Okay. Uh, I have as well. My wife and I just sat down and looked at our budget and made some adjustments even uh, recently this week, in fact. But it's not only that it matters to us, money also matters to God. In fact, there are 2,500 verses in the Bible that talk about money. And it was the second most talked about subject in everything that Jesus talked about. He talked about money the second most. He actually talked about money more than he did about heaven and hell combined. And so if it's important to God's word and it's important to Jesus, it's important to me. And so we're gonna dive in this morning. And before we dive in this morning, uh, I, I wanna just, uh, just kind of let you in on something. If you're newer to our church, we actually have only two kind of buckets of giving that we do here at Saints Community Church. We're not a church that receives an offering for this thing and for that thing, and will you help us with this, and will you help us with that? And it's not that we never do that. It's on a pretty rare occasion uh, that we do that. But most of the time, we only have kind of two buckets. We have the tithe. Everybody say the tithe. Come on, say the tithe. The tithe is just a, a returning back 10% of our income. It's a, it's a word uh, that's found all throughout God's word, and it actually just means 10%. The tithe means 10%. And the, for people that are tithers, they've said, I, I'm, a, I'm willing to obey God's word and surrender my resources to him. It all belongs to him any way it comes from him. And so I'm going to honor him by giving him the first 10%. Everybody say the first 10%. I talked to somebody this week uh, that's the, earlier that said that they didn't even really realize that they weren't giving God, they were giving God the tithe, but it looked more like kind of what was left over at the end after they'd covered everything. And they said that this series has helped them discover that, that they're supposed to give their first 10%, the first portion of their income to the Lord. And then there's a thing called kingdom builders. And Libby already explained it pretty well, but let me just put up a definition of what Kingdom Builders is. Kingdom Builders is an opportunity to excel in generosity by giving over and above the tithe to global missions projects, local projects to better our community, and future expansion projects to reach more people in our locations. There's three words that I want you to think about all the time when we talk about king, Kingdom Builders. One is global. Everybody say global. Okay, the second is local. Everybody say local. 
And the third is future. Everybody say future. So uh, four of you got uh, the future. Uh, everybody just, just bring the energy level up a little bit for me today. I know it's hard to match my energy, but just try, okay? Just uh, let, let's work on that this morning. And so as we think about kingdom builders and we think about wanting to, to excel in generosity, I just want to give you a simple definition. This is actually a, a, dic, a dictionary definition. Generosity in its most basic form means this, to do more than what is required to do more than what is required. This fits really well with the biblical with biblical generosity because we know that the obedient thing to do with our money is to tithe. And and what generosity becomes is hey, it's not just about what I'm required to do, it's going above and beyond what I'm required to do, to do more than what is required. You see, we want to make a difference globally, all over the world. And we're going to walk through some projects uh, this morning about how we are doing that even this year. And we want to do things locally. How many think that the local church should be a part of the solutions of our city, right? I, I do too. And so we want to be a part of things happening locally. And we want to be a part of future expansion, things that will help our locations reach more more people along the way or that will be a part of planting new locations of saints community church so part of our generosity goes toward the expansion of reaching more people now if you're here and you're not a jesus follower and maybe you got invited and uh, you came and you're like listen it's uh you know we're getting close to holiday weekend i got nothing better to do sure i'll go to church with you and you're saying i'm not sure how i feel about this local church thing, or maybe you've been hurt by a local church, or maybe you're looking at what's happening across the world with the local church right now, and you're very skeptical, which I can totally understand how you feel that way. But if you're here and you're not a dedicated Jesus follower, dedicated believer, and you're saying, why does this matter to me? I just want to let you know that what I'm going to talk about today is how the local church should be a part of the solutions for the community and for the world, and that we should actually have a part in making a difference around the world and right here in our community. In other words, every dime that comes into the local church should not just be for the local church. It should be to be a part of ben bettering our community and our world and reaching more people. Come on, how many can get down with that, whether you're a believer or not? Yeah. And so this morning, we're going to talk through that a little bit. And all I want to really do this morning, we're going to cover some material that I've covered a few times in the past, is we're going to kind of get into the why. Why are we generous? Why do we do this generosity thing? Why is this such a push for us as believers? And there's lots of things. There's lots of messages. There's lots of text that come from God's word about generosity. And there's lots of things that I could say about generosity, but at the core of generosity, to answer the reason why, why are we generous as God's people? I think that the core of generosity is the same reason that we do everything else as followers of Jesus, and that is because of Jesus. Come on, y'all. We do everything else as Jesus followers to look and become more like Jesus. Let me say it like this. Generosity has been modeled for us by the one we follow. It's been modeled for us by the one that we follow. His name is Jesus. You see, if we want to look at the kingdom of God and we really want to dive into what does God's kingdom look like and what does it look like to be a kingdom builder, we don't have to look any further than Jesus. One of Jesus' disciples looked at him one day, and he actually said, show us what the Father looks like. We want to know what the Father looks like. Show us the Father. And Jesus' response was, this, guy, this guy's name was Philip. He said, Philip, you don't understand. You don't have to look any further than me to know the Father. Because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We could frame it like this. Jesus not only came to tell us 
what God looks like. He didn't claim to be the best explanation of God. Jesus claimed to be the best explanation of God. Jesus didn't claim, sorry, to have the best explanation of God. Jesus claimed to be the best explanation of God. It wasn't only that he was talking about the Father. One of the reasons that he came to earth was to show us what the Father looks like, to show us what God looks like. In fact, John says it like this. John, who wrote one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John said it like this in the beginning of his Gospel. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word came and dwelled among us. In other words, God came in the form of Jesus and dwelled among us. And one of the reasons that he did that is because he wanted to show us what the Father looked like. And so as we look at Jesus, I want you to pay close attention to what Jesus said and to what Jesus did. Now, before we dive into what he said and what he did, I want to just paint the picture and kind of create the culture and the context of the, the earth that Jesus came to and the, the world that he was a part of. And here's what you got to know. The world that Jesus was a part of was a world where Greek and Roman gods were being worshipped. And everyone knew this. I want you to get this. Please understand this. Everyone knew that the gods in Greek and Roman culture didn't care for people and they didn't require people to care. Let me say that again. The Greek and Roman gods didn't care for people and they didn't require people to care. In Jesus' time, nobody had intrinsic value. Nobody had inherent value. Everyone only had economic value. Listen closely, friends. Even the religious leaders in Jesus' time, even the Jewish leaders in this time had their own version of the karma and the caste system. They used their Jewish laws to keep women, Samaritans, shepherds, leopards, and the lame in their place because they were always reminding the populace that God favored the powerful that God favored the wealthy, that God favored those who had the resources to force their way into society, that God obviously favored men, that poverty and illness were a sign that God was punishing you. And in a culture like that, the idea of compassion and the idea of generosity was completely unnecessary because in that world, people got what they deserved. The poor were getting what they deserved. The sick were getting what they deserved. But I want you to look up at me. This is the culture that Jesus comes into. The culture where might makes right. The culture where money bought you influence. The culture where if you didn't have money and you weren't a part of a certain value system and a certain culture, you didn't have any value. Where if you were poor, you deserved to be poor where if you were sick, you deserved to be sick. In that culture where the Greek and Roman gods, had, had, they had taught that they didn't care about people and they didn't care if you cared about pe- people. I want you to know something powerful and I want you to smile as I say it, my friends, because in that culture that Jesus is born into, even with leaders to religious leaders that were buying into their own version of this caste system look closely y'all then along came the rabbi from galilee hello along came the the rabbi from galilee along came jesus who didn't buy into this culture that everybody else had bought into and everywhere that jesus went He elevated people's dignity. He said, women are not second-class citizens. He said, children are not second-class citizens. He said, it doesn't matter what race you are. He said, you have value. You have intrinsic value. 
Every person on the planet has inherent value. It doesn't matter the economic value. He said, if you're sick, you have value. If you're lame, you have value. If you're a woman, you have value. If you're a child, you have value. He came along and said, I'm not buying into this culture and to this context. I'm going to elevate people's dignity through compassion and generosity along the way. And his own people were fighting him all the way along the process because Jesus came to show them a bigger kingdom. He, sh- he came to show them that the, the, the political system that even existed in that day, which believe it or not, was even more intense. I know it's hard to believe, but it was even more intense than the political system in our day. And everyone around him, including his disciples, including the religious leaders of that day, everyone around him kept saying, when are we going to overthrow the oppression of Rome and the evil political oppression that we have that has actually made us second-class citizens? They kept saying to him, when are you going to rise up and lead us in victory? When are we going to have our rights? When are we going to have our freedoms? When are we going to have our values become a part and to stop being subjugated to the leadership of Rome. Listen, does that sound familiar at all? Hello? And Jesus kept saying to them, yeah, it's about how excited I thought you'd be. Jesus kept saying to them, you don't understand. I didn't come for that. I didn't come in our context for the right or for the left. I came with a different kingdom. I came for a different purpose and to have a different value system than the rest of you. Here's some of the things that we know that Jesus said. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. And then he goes on to say things like, love your neighbor as yourself. Not only did he say love your neighbor, he redefined the word neighbor. He said, not only is it about the person that you think you're like or the person that you agree with, he said, your neighbor is anyone who has a need. And listen, friends, I'm about to give you one of the greatest things that Jesus ever taught. But I just got to help you understand, this was revolutionary. People didn't talk like this. People didn't encourage people to love each other, to care for each other. This was not celebrated in the culture that Jesus was a part of. And then he goes on to say in Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, watch this now, love your, what's he say? Enemy. Love your enemies. Love the person you disagree with. Love the person you're afraid of. Love the person who hurts you, who accuses you, who betrays you. In his most famous Sermon on the Mount, he tells us, love your enemies. And he goes on in Matthew 6, 33, again, talking about the higher kingdom. And he says, but seek First, his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. What does it mean to be a kingdom builder? What does it mean to do what Jesus said? Here's what he said in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. And you invited me in. I needed clothes. And you clothed me. I was sick. And you looked after me. I was in prison. 
and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for who? For me. Whatever you did for those who needed clothes, whatever you did for those who needed fed, whatever you did to help those who are sick, whatever you did to help those who are hungry, whatever you did for those, you've done it for me. And if you want to look at somebody's life, and if you want to see if they are who they say they are, then see if what they say matches up with what they do. Let's talk for a moment about what Jesus did. Jesus' interactions with people were revolutionary. Everybody say revolutionary. In an age where cleanliness was next to godliness and where everyone's goal was just to not touch anyone or anything, to not get themselves dirty, in an age where they wouldn't even let unclean people or dirty people or sick people be in the synagogue for fear that they were unclean and dirty and not what everybody else wanted them to be. In that age, Jesus gave value to people that no one else did. He looks at a Samaritan woman, somebody who is despised by the Jewish culture, and he says, hey, I, have, I give you value. In fact, I give you so much value that I want you to take your Samaritan jug and I want you to put it in your Samaritan well. And I, I am going to put that to my lips to help me drink. He said, and, and she looked at him and she said, that doesn't even make sense. You're not even supposed to be talking to me, let alone allowing me, a Samaritan woman, to give you a drink. Jesus touched people that no one else would touch. He looked at a leper who was lame who would literally have to scream out loud, I'm unclean, you can't touch me, who had a disease with skin boils all over his skin that just one touch and you got that disease. To look at somebody, to look at a man who had most likely never been touched or at least not touched in many, many years, not by his family, not by society, who hadn't had hugged anyone, who hadn't been loved by anyone. And Jesus said, not only am I going to heal you of your leprosy, but I'm going to do something that may be even more important than just healing you. For the first time in years, I'm going to touch you. And you, other people may call you unclean. I call you whole and healed and worthy of my touch. Jesus brought value to even those who were lepers. Jesus hung out with people who no one else did. He looks at a guy named Matthew, who is actually Jewish, but he has betrayed his own people and gone to the other side, and he's a part of the system of collecting taxes from his own people and giving those taxes over to Rome. Matthew was despised by his people, and he was considered the worst of sinners. He was considered the worst of the worst. And he hung out with sinners. And Jesus says, not only do I want to give you value, I want to go to your house. I want to hang out with your people. And the disciples are constantly looking at Jesus and they're saying, man, Jesus, no wonder the religious leaders don't like us. We're hanging out with all the wrong people. We're supposed to hang out with people that look like us and that act like us and that think like us and that are clean like us. And Jesus has to constantly remind his guys, I didn't come to hang out with people that just look like us. I came to help those who need help. And he hangs out at Matthew's house. 
I often wonder if we would look at Jesus, if he was here today physically on our planet, I often wonder where we would find him. I think some of y'all might be a little shocked at where you discovered Jesus was hanging out. And not only does he hang out with Matthew, he hangs out with a guy named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector. He was the chief tax collector, the head honcho, the big boss. He was the tax collector over all the rest of the tax collectors. And he had gained profit by actually robbing people and giving money to himself and turning the rest of it over to Rome. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I want to hang out with you. People that had no value in the Jewish culture, Jesus gave value. Jesus came along and he said, I'm here to turn the world upside down. I'm here to flip the culture, to flip the context of what you think a God person looks like. And he came and he said, listen, I am here to let to give value to people who, who the society doesn't give value to, to, to and to help people that society doesn't want to help. That's why I'm here. Now, some of y'all are here and you're going, okay, but wait, 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 wait. The real reason Jesus came was to save us from our sins, right? Isn't that why he died? And isn't that why he was resurrected? I mean, can, should we be guilty of, of the, as it's light, labeled, the social gospel where all we're doing is just meeting all these social needs? Listen, I am here today to tell you, yes, the main reason that Jesus came was to save you and I from our sins. He went to the cross and he rose from the dead to save us from our sins. Everything that happened before that, listen, couldn't have saved us from our sins. It took his death and his resurrection to save us from our sins. But I want to help you frame it like this. The kingdom of God exists to meet the need. Everybody say the need. Come on, say the need. The need, which is our salvation. But he also came to meet the other needs. The needs and the other needs. Look this way. Here's the amazing thing about what happens after Jesus raises from the dead and then he is ascended to heaven. The disciples and the followers of Jesus, they took what they saw they took what he said, what he did, and what he modeled, and they got it. They got it. They got it so strongly that the first problem in the church, if you go all the way back to the book of Acts, the first problem was that they couldn't get Peter and John to actually stop spending all of their time helping the widows and helping feed people. And they're looking at Peter and John, and they're saying, hey, man, you know, we're so glad that you're willing to get dirty, and you're willing to help the widows, and you're willing to help the poor, and that you're willing, to, but we actually need you to start preaching. You are eyewitnesses of Jesus. You were one of the ones that was there when, when you walked and you talked with Jesus. We need you to start preaching. And they literally had to beg Peter and John to actually stop doing everything that they were doing to meet the needs of the widows and the poor and to help people so they could spend some time focusing on preaching. This is what we call a good problem. Hello? That's the first problem that we read about in the church. And then even after the disciples model it for us so well, and this idea of compassion and generosity and taking care of the needs of others, even after they leave, it continues. It continues so amazingly well that actually if you look at the first century church, what you will find is that when plagues would come into different villages, into different locations all over the world, and everybody would run from those places for fear of getting the plague, for fear of getting sick themselves. They would run from those places where the plagues would hit 
and they would, they would say, I don't want to get this. I don't want to die. Do you know who stayed back and who took care of the sick? Christians, y'all. First century Christians. Did they wear a mask while they were doing it? I don't know. But I know this. They had already known that they'd signed up to give their life over to Jesus, to, as Jesus said, take up their cross and die. And they already knew they were guaranteed eternal life. So when everybody else is running to the hills, when the plagues hit in the first century, the Christians would stay back and they would take care of the sick people that already had the plagues. And they would take care of the poor. They were famous for this. In fact, if you look at the culture, one of the things that as you study this time in history in this culture, one of the customs that they had is during this time in culture, and this is hard for me to even say out loud, but it's just a part, an ugly part of history, is that after babies were born, they would take babies down to a river and they would just let them be. And that what they would say is, if fate would have it that the baby would live, if fate would have it that an animal didn't come and, and eat the baby, or if fate would have it that, that the baby didn't fall into a river, or if fate would have it that the baby wasn't taken by somebody else with evil intentions, then it was God's will for them to live, and for, the, for it was God's will for them to be saved. They would literally drop these babies off by rivers. This was one of the customs back in that time in history. But if you'll study history, what you'll discover is that Christians would come behind those people that were dropping off babies by the river, and they would pick those babies up, and they would take those babies home, and they would adopt those babies, and they would help those babies, and they would raise those babies. No matter what kind of a house they hid, no matter how, how, they, how poor they were, the Christians said, no, those babies have intrinsic value. They are child children of our heavenly father and that we're not going to allow them to be dropped off by a river to see what, what happens with their fate we're going to take them in raise them love them keep them do you know why because they had seen jesus do that hello jesus had modeled this kind of compassion and this kind of generosity let me say it like this while we may be criticized for what we believe, we should be famous for our generosity. While we may be criticized for what we believe, we should be famous for our generosity. We should have people that look in to the church and they say, I'm not convinced maybe of everything that they believe and I'm not convinced maybe of exactly how they live and I may not look like them, and I may not talk like them, but I do respect them. And I do respect the generosity of the church and how the church is helping the world. Let me say it like this. I say this often. Those of you that are sports fans, I used to say this about Tom Brady when he was playing. You don't have to love him, but you do got to respect him. Hello? Six of you understood what that meant. All right. While people may criticize what we believe, we should be absolutely famous for our generosity and how we are helping the global crisis of the world, how we are helping our local community and how we are reaching people. And just as it was counterculture in the day of Jesus to do this, it is counterculture in our current day, to live like this. In our current day, where it seems like more than ever, we are fighting for our rights. We are fighting for what belongs to us. We are mandating things and we are saying, you know, we're gonna, we're, we're, we, you know, we believe that government's gonna change us, and as long as we put the right laws into place, and as long as we, you know, vote this way or vote that way, however you vote, we, you know, we're we're fighting because as at the bottom line of all of that is, we want 
what's ours. Our rights, our values, our system. And the fight that Jesus fought is the fight that we're still fighting. But here's what I want to tell you, y'all. Can you name a time where Jesus fought for his rights? Name a situation. Name a place where Jesus went to battle for his rights. The only time that you saw Jesus in a whole new way was when religious leaders were, were keeping people away from him and from the Lord. The only time that you saw Jesus flip over tables and lose his mind and post on social media was when he saw church people that didn't get it. it. Was when he saw church people, religious people, that treated others in a way that kept them further from God. And I just wonder today, in all of our things, in all of our systems, and in everything else, if the world that doesn't know Jesus looks at us and says, they're doing nothing to make me want to become a Christ follower. Here's the flip side of this. This is what I want you to understand, what I want you to get. We are never more like Jesus than when we are giving. We are never more like him than when we are displaying compassion, displaying generosity. So here's the big question. In a world that is still fighting for its rights, fighting for its thing, and I want me, and I want what's best for mine, what's best for my family. Counterculture question that I want all of us in the room to ask. If you could take a picture of this or write this down, remind yourself of it. Put it on your wall. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror when you wake up in the morning and you are going to the restroom. Listen, write this down. How can I leverage my power, my influence, and my resources? Here's key word, y'all, for myself. Is that what it says? How can I leverage my influence, my power, my resources for, what's the word? Others. How can I take what God's given me, any influence that I happen to have, any power that I happen to have, any resources that I happen to have that the Lord has given me, how can I take that and how can I leverage my life for the benefit of other people, for the sake of others? And that, when you're asking that question, you are here in this local church, what we call a kingdom builder. When you're asking the question on a regular basis, how can I leverage my influences, my resources, and my power for the benefit of others? You are becoming a kingdom built. And I want you to look this way. I have something exciting to tell you. A kingdom builder is even better than being a Republican. Watch this. I'm not leaving you out, Democrats. A kingdom builder is even better than being a Democrat. Oh, not as loud on that one. Okay. Some of you are looking around to go, who got excited about which? Who am I sitting next to? A kingdom builder is better than any government system, which, by the way, will one day, I don't know when, and I'm not wishing this, but all 
government structures and all man-made human systems will all fall away. And someday, all of them in every country, they'll be gone. But you know what will remain? The kingdom of God. How can I leverage my power, my influence, my resources for the sake of others? I want to take a moment right now and I want to walk you through some of the ways that our local church here at Saints Community is doing that and trying to answer that question. How can I leverage my power, my resources, my influence for the sake of others? Because the question that I have to ask and that our staff and our elders and our deacons and our leaders, the question that we have to ask is not just how can I leverage my influence. I have to ask myself, how can I leverage our influence globally, locally, and as we expand to reach more people? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get out your phones. Those of you that are asleep, go ahead, wake your neighbor up if they're asleep. And I want you to scan that QR code that's right in front of you on that on that connect card. Go ahead, get out your phones. Those of you that know how to do this, okay? Get out that phone and I want you to scan the QR code in front of you. Those of you that are like, I don't do QR codes. I don't even like uh, my phone, okay? And I prefer a paper copy. I want you, our ushers are ready right now to hand this out. Lift up your hands if you prefer a paper copy over the phone QR code copy. Come on, lift up your hands. Hey, no worries. We got plenty for everybody. Hey, my own daughter who's 18 wants a, a paper copy. Okay. Go ahead. Give her anybody else that says, I prefer a paper copy uh, of this. We want to get that to you. Uh, Leary looks like uh, Ruby in front of you wants a paper copy as well. So I want to quickly walk through the projects that God has called us to. I'm not going to have time to hang out on any of these too long, but I want to quickly walk you through what we're doing this year so far. We, we first of all, if you look at globally, if you look at BGMC, BGMC is what our children do for kingdom builders. And it actually helps missionaries uh, in, in the Hillcrest Children's Home in Arkansas. Okay, we're giving towards that home. It's a part of the Assemblies of God in our BGMC children. Can I give you a, a quick report? Look this way, y'all. Our kids have already gone over their goal. We're six months in, and our children, come on, y'all, are already killing it, okay? Next, we have a speed to light. This is what our students do for their kingdom builders' emphasis. The speed to light is something that we do uh, to help missionaries across the world by providing transportation and we're actually help building a tabernacle for a group of believers in the country of Mozambique. Our, our students are actually helping us do that. Next we have flex projects. What are those? Those are like as we see a need we're able to meet that need. Some of you heard me say a few weeks ago I was in South Africa and there was a pastor whose wife had lost uh, her job and she uh, he, he looked at me with tears coming down his eyes at an altar time after I was done preaching and said, I was thinking about leaving ministry because my family can't make it on a ministry income. And I was able to go to his leader and I was able to say, I want to send a thousand dollars to this local African pastor just to encourage him not to quit the ministry. How many of you can appreciate those kinds of needs that we're able to meet? Come on, y'all. Not only our flex projects, but venture. Many of you remember Paul that came at the beginning of the year. He's actually at Bell Chase this morning uh, preaching. Venture is an organization. It's a Christian nonprofit that addresses the world's greatest injustices, including human trafficking, refugee crisis, extreme poverty. They intentionally target areas with less than 2% of gospel witness and, it and that receive less than 1% of all Christian Given, giving. Listen, I just texted Paul yesterday and I said, our church is going to give $10,000 towards that organization. How many think we should be a part of the solution of helping human trafficking? Hello? Fighting human trafficking. 
We should be a part of the solution to poverty, everything that Venture is doing. Convoy of Hope, another faith-based organization that helps feed people and helps people that are in crisis after storms hit all over the world. Life Cross Christian Church, we've actually already given to this one. Uh, it's a brand new church that is starting right here in America. It's actually uh, in Maine, okay? And you may not know this, but there's a lot of Muslims in Maine. And this church is actually going after people that are, have claimed to be Muslim and trying to reach them for Jesus. And we have already given towards that need. Those are our global projects. Look at the local projects. Second Harvest Food Bank. We're actually wanting to help and lift the arms of the food bank that is feeding other people. And not only that, Crossroads NOLA, which is the foster care, uh, Christian foster care program that we're actually giving towards. This is a program that helps the foster care system connect ch families in churches with the need of those that need a foster home. And here's what's cool. We have people that have been volunteering at Second Harvest Food Bank, and we had a team that went to Crossroads NOLA this week. So they're saying, I'm not only am I gonna give towards this, I'm actually gonna volunteer. Look at the picture of, this is our lady, some of our ladies that helped serve at Crossroads NOLA. Come on, how many think that's cool? Uh, they were helped serving meals at Crossroads NOLA even this week. Not only that, but our emergency family fund. This is given towards helping our own church people that has helped pay electrical bills or uh, in, in some cases we had to even help people with our mortgage or all kinds of different things that we do to help people in need right here in our local church body. We also give towards the New Orleans mission that is helping to the number one organization in our city that helps with the homelessness and even the trafficking on the streets and so many other issues of addiction. We are helping give towards the New Orleans mission from Saints Community Church. And last uh, uh, but not least is FCA. This FCA exists to help coaches and athletes become Jesus followers and to disciple them. I, have, I just want to give you a quick testimony about FCA. One of our PKs, okay, if you don't know what PK means, pastor's kids, named Parker Rickett, Pastor Daniel and Laura's son that is in our Bell Chase location, is a, he's a supreme athlete, okay, and he's playing competitive soccer. And he has been wanting to reach one of his buddies that he plays soccer with. And our FCA team from our church invited Parker to bring his teammate, who has been a declared atheist for a long time, to come to FCA camp with him. And that teammate went to FCA camp, but not only did he go to FCA camp, he gave his life to Jesus Christ at FCA camp. But it doesn't stop there. Here's what's more, even more amazing. I got to meet him last week because he was in our Bell Chase location, sitting right next to Parker in the seat there, listening to me preach. Isn't that amazing? So what God is doing through FCA is even blessing our local church right here at Saints Community. And then last but not least, we've got three future projects we're giving towards this year. Bell Chase, finishing projects. We're so close. And I know some of you are like, I've been hearing that for so long. We're so close to being debt free in our Bell Chase location. We have one more contractor bill and then that location will be completely debt free. Yes, we've had to rebuild an entire facility over there in Bell Chase. But can I give you some good news? We're debt free in that location very soon. Debt free. Everybody say debt free. Come on. I like that, even if y'all don't care. All right? Next is our guest experience project in Metairie. Some of you are like, what does this mean? Uh, well, if you've noticed, some of you don't even notice, uh, but if you've noticed, we have a few things here in this location that we need to do to have a better guest experience. A couple of things uh, that I'll just mention right off the top. If you look at our screens, okay, uh, how many, first of all, have ever noticed that one screen is darker than the other screen? Raise your hands if you've ever noticed that. Here's a bigger, I can't believe only like six people. I notice it every week, okay? How many of you have 
notice sometimes that it's not always super bright in a way that's easy to see. Raise your hand. Yep. Hey, can I give you a secret? Those of you that attend our church, this really, I, I'm not, I, I want to be a blessing to you and I want you to be able to see the screen better. My bigger concern is for a guest that comes into our church that they be able to see this. And I, I if I'm here for weeks on end preaching, I start to not notice this. You know what I notice it? When I go to our Bell Chase location and their screen comes up and it's like, and I'm like, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like. Hey, so we're, we're trying to get some new screens to help our guests be able to see better. How many of you have noticed, and I, I shouldn't even point this out because you're going to notice it now, but you've noticed huge cracks in, in our windows in our uh, lobby. Come on, how many of you have noticed that? Okay, I shouldn't have said anything because now you're all going to notice it. But those are things that we don't want guests to be turned off. We want guests to come in and feel like we are ready for them. Like we've prepared our facility for them. And so those are some of the things that we're doing. And then last but not least, we are wanting to get a seed, okay? A seed for our third location. We want to plant a seed that says, hey, we're not ready to launch that yet. Okay, don't get scared, y'all. We're not launching a third location. But what we want to do is say, when God releases us, when it's time to launch that third location, we've already started sowing towards that third location. We've already got a seed going of whenever God tells us it's time to launch that third location, we are ready. Now, I want to give you some news, okay? Our Kingdom Builders goal, globally, locally, future, is this. Our Kingdom Builders goal that we want to do by December is $125,000, okay? And I believe we can get there because I want to share the number that we are at right now, okay? Here is our current number where we're at halfway through the year. So far, to Kingdom Builders, we have given $39,070. Come on, y'all. Come on, we're getting there. We're getting there. I believe we're going to finish strong. Here's what we ask everybody to do. We ask everybody, first of all, if you're not a tither, that's your first step, okay? We actually want you to take that step before you start giving uh, to Kingdom Builders. But after you've given your tithe, okay, over and above, when you begin to excel in generosity, we want people to have what's called plan giving, which many of you do so well. That just means you've got a plan, okay? You're giving weekly, you're giving monthly, you're giving quarterly, whatever that looks like for you, where you're regularly giving to kingdom builders. You've actually got planned giving. And then the second thing that we want you to do is we want you to have creative giving. Creative giving is simply, what can I do, okay, that's outside of maybe just my regular giving that I can do? What can I do to, to raise money for kingdom builders? Let me give you a couple examples. Number one, we are, uh, every year we have a fantasy football league. Uh, Saints Community Church, we call it Kingdom Builders Fantasy Football League. Last year, that Fantasy Football League raised $2,000 to give towards Kingdom Builders. It's a huge blessing, y'all, to not only <laughs> be able to give to Kingdom Builders, but to do it, to actually do what I love to do. And uh, I actually won the league last year. Uh, to be able to see y'all that weren't excited about that, I won uh, the league last year. Beat my sister, who was in second place. Uh, and so as we we give to kingdom builders we're also getting to do what we love amen so we have a golf tournament this year that my friend professional golfer in our church billy trinchard is going to do i don't golf i'm not a good golfer i always say i don't play golf golf plays me uh but but i'm gonna golf that day because it's uh he's trying to raise ten thousand dollars for kingdom builders come on how many y'all think that's a good goal okay we have a garage sale okay that we raised a bunch of money from last year and so we're doing it again this year, even bigger and better. Those are things that we're doing creatively where people are putting these things together. Now, what that doesn't mean is uh, I have an idea and I want the staff to run the idea. I want you to come open the building, do everything. And aren't you so glad I came up with, with that idea? That's not what it means, okay? And, and so we want people to do creative. And then last but not least, we want people to have dream giving, dream giving. That is giving out of God's overwhelming abundance. We've had people that have sold 
their house. And all of a sudden they came into a, a, a sum of money that they're not usually a part of. And they, they gave thousands of dollars to kingdom builders. We had somebody that hit the stock market uh, really well several years ago. And they gave a bunch of money, I think $40,000 uh, to kingdom builders. That's what we call dream giving. Like where you have a dream of giving that much and God provides out of his generosity an overwhelming abundance. We do all of this because we are modeling our life after our master. Amen? Because Jesus modeled it. We get to do it.